Hello, U.S. history students. Today we are going to learn about a uh, very interesting and often underreported event in the uh, history of the United States and the home front during World War II. That would be the Zoot Suit Riots of 1943 that happened in Los Angeles, California. An important and interesting thing. So here's a little background for you first. Uh, first off, during the Mexican Revolution between 1910 and 1920, around a million people emigrated from Mexico to the U.S. Southwest. Uh, tens of thousands more arrived in the 1920s as well. So uh, the Mexican Revolution caused a big upheaval and changed to where a lot of people lived. Let's not forget, of course, that there were many, many descendants of Mexicans living in the Southwest before 1848 as well, because, don't forget, much of the entire West had been part of Mexico until the War of 1848 and was annexed by the United States following the uh, Mexican-American War. So um, by the late 1930s, there were about 3 million Mexicans and Mexican-Americans in the country. And Los Angeles actually had the largest Mexican-American com uh, community of any U.S. city. Uh, over here on the right, you actually see some picture, a picture of some farm workers in the Coachella Valley in California, which isn't far from Los Angeles. So yeah, a very, very large Mexican community then as now. Um, important time to be understanding here. So by the time we started rolling into the 1940s, there were actually a lot of things going on where there had been Mexican-American youth who were, you know, a generation or two deep or more. Um, and they had formed styles of speech and dress for the youth that were neither traditionally Mexican nor traditionally American. Here's some teenagers, Chicano teens in LA in the 1940s. They had some really distinct stuff going on. Um, Segregation had kept them from things like public pools, social clubs, movie theaters, restaurants, uh, you know, they kept them in separate schooling, all kinds of stuff. Uh, many other places, there were a few social outlets for teens at this time. So they had to get creative. These kids had to get creative. They were, you know, they'd start doing things like cruising the boulevard, hanging on the streets, doing like different, different stuff that they could pull off, having their own social clubs, right? Um, they tended to, unfortunately, partially as a result of this, get socially isolated in their communities. But uh, they were also pressured at the same time to assimilate in school. So told that they could not speak Spanish. They were punished for speaking Spanish. Uh, you know, they're segregated in their own classrooms, alienated and humiliated, often told that they were lesser than. Real problematic stuff. Um, they were uh, also oftentimes alienated from their own families and communities because, hey, this was some wild style that was really different from the traditional Mexican style that had been uh, carried on by their parents and other people in their families. Uh, oftentimes those families were very conservative, um, very Catholic, different kind of community values, and these kids were kind of coming up with their new stuff. In fact, it was starting a new cultural hybrid, an acculturated American identity the Chicano identity that was forming at this time. And this is a really distinct and interesting identity. Big part of this fashion was zoot suits, a type of fashion worn by urban youth, really popular among Mexican Americans. Uh, also, came, it came out of black jazz musicians. They were, um, these were some oversized, tapered at the ankles kind of suits. You can see them over here. On the right, you can also see, as it is typical here, we're talking about like 13, 14, 15 year olds a lot of the times. These are kids. Uh, these were, you know, black jazz musicians have been wearing these. They were like a, a new and wild style. They were defying segregation through, like with a lot of other groups through jazz. This is uh, giving kids a lot of confidence, a lot of new style, a lot of swagger. People were able to walk up and down the streets with this new style, new, new, uh, new ideas. And this gave people a lot of confidence to kind of do their own things and form their own path. Um, of course, some adults in their own community also saw these flashiness of these zoot suits as excessive. In their own community, they were seen as being uh, non-traditional and being little punks who were making the old people mad. Um, and among white people, these were sometimes seen as even being antagonistic and un-American, and particularly by white servicemen. So this was being seen as this kind of expression of POC uh, kind of glamour and style that was being seen as way too excessive and flashy by some in their own families and definitely by a lot of white Americans. 
So we're ending up with some tensions and some real problems that were rising up. And also these kids are hanging out together and what we're starting even at this time to be classified as gangs. Um, kids all the time everywhere get into trouble together, right? But uh, these were, you know, ways to classify groups of kids into their own and into categories that law enforcement could mess with. So in the 1940s, as I mentioned, Mexican-Americans continued to face this racial segregation in schooling and housing, movie theaters, restaurants, swimming pools, and more, also facing severe discrimination in employment and by the criminal justice system. Um, horrific acts of violence like lynchings uh, continued on as well and were definitely occurring at this point. Uh, simultaneously, in 1942, the United States started the Bracero Program, which was extremely extremely important and a major change. It was a program to import Mexican workers to fill the large agricultural labor, labor shortage during World War II. And this began in 1942. It was the need to ensure an agricultural labor supply. And in the end, that ended up turning out to be the uh, U.S. government's main concern in responding to what would be called the Zoot Suit Riots, at least after the dust settled and uh, there were some real issues. But um, importantly, as this was going on, there was also a really large number of servicemen and women stationed in and around Los Angeles and in Southern California in general. And the majority of them happened to be white. Remember the military was segregated by race at this time. So the white servicemen were in, well, you know, you could call their own gangs, right? Um, a lot of people in, on the West Coast saw the West Coast as frontline potential for any sort of Japanese attacks by sea, especially if what had, after what had happened in Pearl Harbor. And so uh, there were also like community militia people. People were armed civilians and there were guns on the beaches and, uh, you know, artillery encampments and stuff like that on the beaches and lots and lots of soldiers in the streets, lots of soldiers on the West Coast. It was seen as a frontline potential and it definitely upped the tension in the region. Um, also really important to remember is that many white men were going to war or in the service at this point. And uh, good defense industry jobs were actually being filled by women and POC at the time, as you learned about in the reading. And uh, that's black people, uh, you know, Latinx people, um, and also Japanese people as well, Asian people, and white resentment to this was very high and created, again, again more tension. Um, and in fact, a lot of these white service people and white people on the West Coast in general actively supported Japanese internment uh, that happened that we've learned about and the taking of property as this is considered to be, you know, taking away jobs and opportunities from white people, even though many of them were actually in the service, both men and women, but the tension was rising. Um, so, there is this case called the of the of the uh, the the whole thing with the Zoot Suit riots happened in 1943. But leading up to that, they were actually uh, there was actually a really important case that happened about six months earlier. So the Sleeping Lagoon murder trial was a controversial case that involved Los Angeles police detaining 600 Mexican American teenagers in response to finding one Mexican American teenager dead and suspected to be murdered. So they started to use a lot of the language around what we still hear with regard to gangs and the need to crack down on gangs, even though ultimately, you know, they're, they were detaining, using this to indiscriminately detain hundreds and hundreds of teens, especially profiling them by dress and race. Um, the governor, Cuthbert Olson, was using this as an opportunity to crack down on what he saw as a Mexican-American juvenile community that he considered to be out of control. This trial violated due process for these kids and uh, was seen by many Mexican-Americans as unjust. Um, they saw it as a biased judge. 20, there was a biased judge, lack of counsel, lack of evidence. Uh, 22 Mexican-American teens were actually found guilty in this, but it was overturned several years later and all of the accused were released. So, um, there was tension that had been building up in the city around this. There were definitely there was definitely talk around it and some uh, some anger in the Mexican American community, and then also further um, anger. There was anger in the Mexican American community for what was seen as a uh, overreach by the Justice uh, Department and by the police, and anger in the white communities that they saw as this out of control Latino youth problem going on, and. Uh, there was rioting that started in May and June of 1943. These are a picture of some white servicemen getting ready, all very much armed with bats and uh, other other improvised weapons to go and uh, 
get into fights essentially with uh, Mexican youth, with Ch Chicano youth. So uh, these June riots started on June 3rd and they lasted several days in Los Angeles. Thousands of servicemen participated and uh, police actually, either some of them participated, but mostly they stood by. Um, thousands participated and they targeted Mexican American youth with beatings and racial slurs and stripped them of their zoot suits. As you can see up here in this picture, people were stripped of their zoot suits and then the zoot suits were burned. They were beaten. Uh, they were beaten with, uh, with clubs and with other weapons. A lot of these kids were 12, 13 years old. Most of them were teenagers. Real problems. I mean, there was, of course, plenty of uh, pushback as well. Uh, these are, you know, kids aren't, these kids aren't going to all be pushed around, so they would also fight back. And this is a picture here of them fighting back against some service people who are attacking them. But uh, it was a real, real brawl, but again, mostly initiated by the white service people attacking um, Latino teens, Chicano teens. Uh, they're pulled out of theaters and other hangout spots. Their suits were torn off. Um, you know, there were basically thousands of white civilians cheering on these kids getting beaten up and harassed by the police and uh, beaten up by service people. A lot of the, the white civilians were actually recent Midwest transplants, Dust Bowl refugees and so on and so forth. Whereas many of the Mexican families and Chicano families had been in Los Angeles for a really long time. Um, so in the end, it set off, uh, the police actually ended up arresting more than 500 Mexican Americans while no servicemen were arrested. And uh, the incident set off a wave of attacks against Latinos and Latinos, uh, Latinx people in seven other U.S. cities. Uh, this included targeting people of all ages, young, old, suit suits or not. Um, again, targeted primarily by race and neighborhoods. So neighborhoods were raided by, um, by white mobs in other cities. Uh, in East L.A., as we talked about during the actual event, and especially there, it kept on happening for a while, bars, cafes, theaters, whole neighborhoods were trashed. Um, a week later, the military uh, command in Brass declared Los Angeles to be off limits to active service members to try to stop the violence, um, while city council actually passed an ordinance, there's a picture of the city council here, passing an ordinance banning the uh, zoot suit wearers. So basically anybody wearing a zoot suit could get punished with 30 days in jail. Wow, pretty extreme, um, but that's what ended up happening. And after a few years, there were some commissions and dueling commissions came up with different conclusions about what happened with these zoot suit riots. And that was a, that's a whole issue in and of itself. But the big central historical question for the day is what we want to think about, what caused the zoot suit riots? So I want you to look into this historical question as you do the DBQ in reading today.